Welcome to today's conversation again, and thank you for joining us with the National Fair Housing Training Academy's National Fair Housing Forum titled Strategies for Addressing Discrimination, Housing Providers' Use of Criminal Records. My name is Kashana Hill, and I am a NAFTA faculty member, and I also serve as the Executive Director of the Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center. I'm incredibly excited to once again serve as forum moderator. Today's topic brings light to a very important conversation. For those of you who may be new to this topic, approximately one in three people in the United States has an arrest or conviction in their past. For individuals leaving prison, one out of 10 will experience homelessness in the future. People who have been arrested or convicted are at risk for homelessness and subsequent recidivism. We are looking forward to hearing from a variety of speakers during today's forum and diving much deeper into this issue. Before we begin, please note, this forum features information and examples that represent the experiences of the speakers. The comments made today do not necessarily reflect the policies of HUD. Now, before we get started, let's review some quick technical tips and instructions. TJ, over to you. Thanks, Kashana. If any of you do have technical difficulties today with audio or video, we recommend that you first sign out of the webinar and then sign back in. And if you're still having trouble after that, you can request help in the Q&A box located on the Zoom panel section at the bottom of your screen, or you can send an email to the address at the bottom of the slide, that's NAFTA, N-F-H-T-A, at cloudburstgroup.com. We do encourage you to ask questions. You can enter your questions at any time by clicking the same Q&A button on the Zoom panel. Please note, though, that due to time constraints, we might not be able to answer your questions today. The webinar is scheduled for two hours and is being recorded. The recording and transcript will be made available on the NAFTA website on HUD Exchange along with resources that supplement today's conversation. Back to you, Kishana. Thank you, TJ. Once again, I'm honored to present Demetria McCain, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. As many of you know, Demetria has long been a champion in the fair housing community and is committed to advancing racial equity, inclusiveness, and reinvestment in neighborhoods. Demetria. A pleasure to once again have you join us. Thank you. Of course, again, Kashana, it's a pleasure speaking with you today. Um, hey, folks, I'd like to welcome you to our July, can you believe it's already July, our July NASA Forum, Strategies for Addressing Discrimination, Housing Providers Use on Criminal Records. So folks, listen, individuals with criminal histories consistently face barriers to obtaining and maintaining housing, and barriers that reflect well-established and consistent racial disparities, as Kashana mentioned, across the United States' criminal justice system. Now, the Biden-Harris administration recognizes the importance of helping persons who have criminal involvement, helping them re-enter society and, and, and truly reunite with their families and find stable housing and safe homes. Now, President Biden declared in April 2022, mind you, that was actually Fair Housing Month, he declared in April 2022, Second Chance Month. And HUD Secretary Fudge actually issued a memorandum instituting an agency-wide effort to review HUD's programs to ensure HUD, its funding recipients, and program recipients are as inclusive as possible of individuals with criminal involvement. And just last month, on June 10th, our office, FHEO, issued a memorandum highlighting our Office of General Counsel's 2016 guidance on how to apply the Fair Housing Act Fair Housing Act standards, actually, when housing providers and others use criminal records. Because too often, housing providers 
criminal records policies may violate the Fair Housing Act and other civil rights laws. Now today, you'll hear more from panelists on how to spot these violations, and you'll hear about best practices around conducting investigations related to the use of criminal records and best practices for housing providers in their actual use of criminal records when they're screening tenants. So we have a lot that uh, we're gonna hear from, from these panelists today. And I will tell you that this is certainly a priority of our secretary, Marsha L. Fudge as well. So I'm not gonna waste time. I'm gonna get out of the way and I'll pass the baton back to you, Kashana. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Demetria. I would now like to present Richard Cho, Senior Advisor for Housing and Services in the Office of the Secretary at HUD. In this role, Richard advises the Secretary on HUD's efforts to end homelessness, protect HUD-assisted households from COVID-19, advance the community integration of people with disabilities, connect housing with healthcare, and create housing options for formerly incarcerated people and others who have interacted with the criminal legal system. Richard, it's a pleasure to have you join us today. Thank you, Kashana, and thanks to Demetria for your remarks, um, as, and thank you to the National Fair Housing Training Academy for putting this um, training together um, on a really important and I think far-reaching issue. Um, I think it's already been said, um, we know um, the number of people who have criminal justice involvement in, in the United States of America um, are, is significant. Um, we have um, been, we're coming out of a period of many decades of mass incarceration, uh, where uh, uh, on any given year, we have 2 million people in this country um, who are behind bars, um, uh, many in uh, state and federal prisons, uh, many more in local jails, uh, and about 600,000 people uh, leave uh, prisons uh, about 10 million people actually churn in and out of uh, local jails um, every year. Um, and as Kashana mentioned, uh, one in three uh, Americans reports having some form of arrest or criminal um, record or criminal history. Um, 70 million people report having a felony conviction. So we're talking about an issue that reaches many, many Americans. Now, um, as Dimitri mentioned, uh, both President Biden and Vice President Harris um, and Secretary Fudge recognized that um, we not only have way too many people uh, behind bars, uh, but also that um, people who have experienced criminal justice involvement should not have to uh, also um, experience the collateral consequences of that incarceration where they end up living um, a second sentence in the community where they face numerous barriers to employment, um, to licenses, uh, and um, ultimately to housing. Um, and therefore, uh, um, both the president um, and the secretary have charged HUD um, to really look at all the ways that we can help reduce barriers to access to a number of programs, um, including housing um, for people who have been involved in the criminal justice system and to support um, their reentry. Um, over the last several months, HUD's been conducting uh, a discernment process, so really an investigation to really understand um, better uh, what um, our role should be in helping to meet um, housing needs. And what we found is really three things. Um, first, we found that um, housing is actually critical to reentry. Um, it's critical to successful community integration of people leaving prisons and jails, uh, and that housing uh, can serve as a, a foundation for um, helping people to obtain uh, jobs, um, to obtain health care, to reconnect with family members, um, and to help uh, successfully reenter the community and avoid criminal justice involvement. Um, second, we also found that uh, broadly screening out people um, based on their criminal histories um, actually does not necessarily contribute to public safety, but in fact, it may um, um, do the opposite. It may actually make public safety worse uh, because you take um, uh, um, housing away from people uh, who, have, who actually need that housing in order to, to successfully reenter communities. Uh, but actually, um, the overbroad use of criminal records um, as a way to, to assess people's risk of, of criminal justice involvement in the future um, is actually a, a very uh, a kind of ineffective way to screen people um, out. In fact, uh, it, it um, overvalues uh, people's uh, risk uh, relative to their uh, potential recidivism. Um, third, we also found that uh, despite um, guidance that I think you'll hear about today, and that was issued in 2016 by HUD's Office of General Counsel, that pointed out that the overbroad use of criminal records may violate the Fair Housing Act. Um, despite the protections that people have under the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, 
um, despite the fact that uh, the Violence Against Women Act actually um, uh, provides additional protections for people who have criminal records that relate to their um, um, experience of domestic or intimate partner violence um, or sexual assault, um, that um, many HUD-assisted um, housing providers continue to uh, uh, make inconsistent or overbroad use of criminal records and housing decisions. And so, as um, uh, Principal Deputy uh, McCain mentioned, um, HUD has been undertaking at the Secretary's charge a comprehensive review of all of our guidance and policies and ways that we can ensure that um, HUD's programs are as inclusive as possible with people with criminal records. Um, and what we're looking to do uh, is essentially to make sure that while um, the laws and statutes um, indicate that uh, HUD assisted housing providers often do have the discretion to conduct some level of criminal record screening, that that is not an unlimited uh, discretion, that um, they need to ensure that they're complying with um, fair housing, with the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and with, with the Violence Against Women Act, um, but also um, uh, really looking for um, instances where criminal records um, are uh, uh, what we call a non-discriminatory legitimate interest, um, and where they actually uh, is related to potential harm to persons or property, uh, and secondarily, that um, you're taking into account the whole person uh, and all of the other circumstances. How long ago was that conviction? Uh, what was the age at the time of the conviction? Um, and is there other um, supporting evidence that uh, the person has um, experienced rehabilitation um, and that the, their uh, um, criminal record is not necessarily a indicator that they will be a risk to persons or property? Um, in other words, um, we want to make sure that we are implementing our programs in ways that we are not taking criminal records at face value, and that uh, people, we, we recognize that people are more than their criminal records, that they're whole persons with whole life experiences, um, and that uh, what we are looking to do is ensure that our housing providers that we um, fund uh, and, and, and oversee um, are uh, really conducting an individualized assessment of risk with regard to criminal records. So uh, that's, that's what we are working on with regard to HUD-assisted housing. Um, of course, our reach doesn't reach out to um, all the private um, housing um, owners who don't necessarily have HUD assistance, and that's where um, fair housing comes into play. So the trainings that um, you will receive today, I think, play an important complementary role in ensuring that we are looking for um, instances where um, landlords, um, whether HUD assisted or not, um, are um, uh, using criminal records in ways that is leading to housing discrimination. So um, really, um, again, want to just thank you for being here today. Uh, thank uh, uh, NAFTA for putting this together uh, and thank our uh, FHEO colleagues um, for really um, providing the content here today. Um, I, I know this will be a terrific and valuable training. With that, um, I'll turn it back to you again, Shana. Thank you so much, Richard, and thanks again to uh, Demetria McCain for joining us today. These remarks, I think, really um, set a great stage for the conversation that we are going to have today. As we move on, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce to you all Mr. Anthony Johnson for a conversation that we'll have. Mr. Johnson is a person with lived experience of incarceration, homelessness, and housing discrimination. Born and raised in Chicago, he has an associate's degree from Kennedy King City College of Chicago and a bachelor's degree from Columbia College. And Mr. Johnson is a very effective advocate for more inclusive screening procedures in, in housing. Mr. Johnson, welcome to today's conversation. In well, thank earlier, you very much. In an earlier conversation that you and I had, you shared that your experience with the legal system began to turn around when you encountered a judge who listened to your experiences and treated you with compassion. And as you said to me, this judge treated you like you were a human being. Unfortunately, it seems that that kind of compassionate treatment hasn't really been a part of your housing search so far. Would you mind sharing a little bit about your housing history since your release earlier in the pandemic? Yes, I will. First, I want to give honor and glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, God has protected me from hurt, harm, danger to the streets, um, and stab wounds, being shot at, jaw broke twice, and everything else that goes along with the street. You know, my housing search that began, um, well, first of all, my mother had died back in 2014 
And that kind of, uh, I, I, I made some bad choices, you know, because I was battling alcohol and so forth. But after going to court, after getting, you know, catching a case while I was under influence and going to court, uh, this, this judge gave me a chance. But but the problem that I had was once that I got inside the jail, COVID hit. And so I was discharged out of the Cook County Jail. You got to excuse the background. There's an emergency ambulance was coming around. I was, I was discharged homeless in the middle of a pandemic and I was COVID positive because uh, I was on a deck with uh, 40 guys and 25 of the guys, including myself, was all COVID positive. So with that said, when I came out, I had to pray and ask God to help me, you know, because I had nowhere to go. Uh, the shelters were not taking anybody and nor they were letting anybody out. And actually when I was walking on the street, I actually thought the rapture had happened. And, you know, and I was the only one that got left because I'm walking down the middle of the street with nobody on the street. And it's like nine, nine, nine thirty at night. So with that said, uh, I had nowhere to go. Um, so I went to Norwegian hospital and I told him, you know, I was sober. I had just got out of jail and they wouldn't let me in. They would not let me in the hospital because I wanted to get into detox, you know, their detox program. I knew that was a program I could get into. And he told, wouldn't let me in it because he told me that I had no drugs or no alcohol in my system. And so with that said, uh, the one of the nurses winked at me and she said, well, if you had any alcohol in your system, then we could let you in the program. And once I did that, I, I left, put some alcohol in my system, came back, they admitted me into the program, and then I was COVID positive. So from there, uh, I was in isolation, and then they, they uh, transferred me to the overflow center at McCormick Place. But it wasn't a transfer. I was actually kicked out of the hospital because they were pe when they were taking me out of the hospital, there were lines of patients in the hallway on gurneys that were COVID positive, and they were waiting on the room. So with that said, they transferred me over there. So when I got out of there, when it, when it was coming out of there, there was no place for me to go. So not only am I, what I, was I recovering from COVID, and I was homeless, I had a criminal record. And finally, when the COVID lifted, a uh, little bit of restrictions lifted, I ended up at Breakthrough Ministries. Well, a ministry that was in, uh, uh, in Chicago. And that's when I applied for housing. And uh, I made it to the top of the waiting list. And when I went for the interview, the first, they denied me because of my criminal background. And Mr. that was Johnson, in May. Mr. Johnson, can I just interrupt you uh, to ask a clarifying yes. question here, just to make sure um, that that our attendees understand where you were looking. So you mentioned that you would apply for housing and you made it to the top of the wait list. Was this HUD housing that you're speaking about, public housing that you applied for? CHA. Yes, okay. Chicago Housing Authority. Yeah, and I made it to the top of the waiting list and I believe it was May 2021. And I had all of my certificates. I had all of my um, recommendation letters. Uh, everything that I had done positive, uh, community service uh, letters, everything. And when I got there, they were like, okay, and I showed them, you know, this is what I've been doing in my life. I know I have a criminal background, but this is what I've been doing. And, you know, please review. I had a folder. Unfortunately, I lost because I'm homeless and it, yeah, that's another story. But I was like, look at, look at this, my portfolio. You know, I, I have, I've done some credible things. And they were like, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to take a look at that a little later on. So I filled out the application and left and thinking that they were going to call me back for a second interview or whatever case may be. Later on, I got a letter in the mail stating that I was denied because of my criminal background. And that hurt. That, you know, because I'm living in a, a, a place that, you know, I, it, it, before, before I got locked up, I was living in a abandoned building, you know. This is, uh, I don't know if you can see that or not, but I was in the, living in this building. And, you know, for them to, to deny me like that, especially for the positive things that I was doing and, and trying to help the community and being a positive, you know, and, and, and turning, turning the page on my, on my past, that was like a, 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 a hit, you know, a, that, was, that was a hit in the gut. So with that said, uh, you know, I, I, I was dealing with depression. I was dealing with a lot of anxiety. You know, I was battling uh, the urge to drink and so forth. And it, it was just a, a bad time. And not only that, the next month, 
I get, you know, I get another interview to go to another CHA apartment. And I, you know, I went apprehensively because of what happened to me the first time. And I had my portfolio and I showed them about my credentials and everything that I was doing positive and so forth. And I thought that was going to, you know, I was going to get an apartment there. And about a, about a few days after the interview, I get another denial letter that they deny me about my criminal background, which that just, I mean, I, I had kind of lost all hope at that time. Mr. Johnson, when you received these two denials, were you ever given any opportunity to explain your circumstances? I know you mentioned, um, you know, the paperwork that you had, certificates and things like that. I know you mentioned having gone through treatment and we've heard about, you know, your college background. Did you ever get the opportunity to explain anything about your circumstances um, before or after you were denied? Absolutely not. I was explaining to the people while I was, you know, I told them, I said, look, you know, I've have had, I've got a, a, a criminal history. I've been to prison uh, seven times and I've been, you know, I, I, but all of my arrests was under the influence. I had this uh, alcohol battle. And with that said, I'm clean, I'm sober now. And I want you to take my, you know, my, my credentials in consideration and my letters of recommendation and everything that I've done positive, you know, into consideration. And as, as a person, as I was filling out the forms, and they were like, okay, well, we'll, we'll do that, we'll do that, but this ain't the time for that. We'll, we'll, we'll take it, we'll get a chance to look at all that. And they actually lied to me. So Mr. Johnson, given then that you were denied twice um, from public housing uh, after your release, what is your current housing situation? I'm currently living in a shelter. Um, I'm living in a shelter now and the shelters, you know, they are good places to be. However, if a person, uh, how can I say it? If a person has nowhere else to go, then that is a, a place for them to be. However, shelters are not the best places to be because there are people there that have serious mental problems. There are people that are ODing in there. There are people that are having drugs in there. You're dealing with, you're, you're having roommates that don't care nothing about you or a person that's in a bed that's next to you will steal from you. They, there are no metal detectors in these shelters. So there's a possibility that the person that you may have any kind of uh, words with will kill you. And it, it's, it's a very, I mean, you know, it, it, if it's out of the, the elements, that's a good thing. But there are people who I have been on the street with who live in tents, who live up under bridges, who sleep in abandoned garages and abandoned houses. They would rather be there than in the shelters because of the threat that a person has to their person's well-being. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, that's so helpful. And so that we can stay on time today and so that I don't keep you too long, um, I'm, I'm going to ask one last question. Um, given everything you've shared with us and uh, how important you know housing to be as you work to get back on your feet. If you could request anything from property owners and housing providers about the screening procedures they use, what would that request be? The, the request that I would have is, is that they deal with people on individual basis, not just, now we make bad, I made a lot of bad choices, but however, people do improve and people do change. One of the things that I've learned is that the system is designed to pretend to help people, but in the end game, it has been designed to separate families and to keep people homeless. For instance, a person that has been ra born, bred, raised, and bred in public housing, say, for instance, and then they commit a crime or they get caught up in the system. They go to jail or go to prison, and then when they come out, they cannot go back to their families. They because they have a criminal background, which means that opens the door for homelessness. That opens the door for a person to be on the street. That opens the door for a person to commit more crimes because they can't go home, but they have a place where they've been that gives them three hots in a cot, which is jail. So a person will go back to jail because at least that they have shelter. So my, the answer to your question is, is that I believe that if the, if the individuals that are giving housing would take that into consideration on a case by case basis and not just blanketly and the whole landscape, 
of denying people housing because of their criminal background, even if they, even if, and they're nonviolent and they have no threat to anyone. It's, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me that why they would be designed. And I've been with a lot of people in these streets that, that are good people, but they, and made bad choices, but the system will not give them a second chance. Mr. Johnson, we are so appreciative of you taking the time to be with us today and doing everything that you needed to do in order to be here. I know it could not have been easy and we very much appreciate your story and your time. As you know, it is so incredibly important and helpful for people to yes. hear stories like yours as we continue our work. So please accept thanks from all of today's attendees. Thank you so much. Yes, and I want to say thank you for everyone who has helped me, the, uh, the organizations, uh, the politicians, and everyone who has opened the door that didn't look at my background, but look at the person that you see now. And it's only by the grace of God, and I thank my God for touching people's hearts to be able to understand that, yes, I made bad choices, but I am not a bad person. And I want to thank everybody that's, that's on this panel for allowing me to speak. Because there are a lot of people that I see daily, even just by coming over here, that need help. And they need everyone on this panel to be able to assist them to get them off the street and to get them in adequate housing so they can be housed and they can move forward to be, live and be productive citizens. Because living on the street is a bad place to be. I have been there. Well, we wish you the very best of luck, Mr. Johnson. And we thank you again so very much. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much for joining us. As we move on, Thank you very Thank you like, for having Thank you. As we move on, I'd like to share the learning objectives for today's forum. They are listed on your screen and we also encourage you all to take a look at them in further detail on the NAFTA HUD exchange page. At this time, I will introduce our panel speakers. You all can find out everything about them from their bios available on the forum page of the NAFTA website. Joining us today, we have Stefan Woods, Anna Bruton, Maggie Donahue, and Natalie Maxwell. Please keep in mind that during today's roundtable discussion, you will all have the opportunity to submit questions at any time via the Q&A box and we will do our best to address those questions later on in today's conversation. However, please note that we may not have time to get to all questions and personal questions will not be addressed. Also, as a reminder, today's event is being recorded. The slide deck is already available on the forum page on HUD Exchange, and we'll share the link in the chat. Additionally, other materials, including the event recording, will be available on HUD Exchange soon after the event. Please do remember to type any questions that you may have into the Q&A box. With that, we will get started with our first panelist. Stefan. Thank you so much, Kashana, and good afternoon or good morning to everyone. Uh, as Kashana mentioned, my name is Stefan Woods, and I am a trial attorney here at, OG at HUD in the Office of General Counsel, and I'm joined by my colleagues Anna Bruton and Maggie Donahue. And today we will be discussing how the Fair Housing Act is implicated by housing providers' use of criminal records. And first, I'd like to contextualize the conversation a bit because we, we all understand and know that there is an overrepresentation of black and brown people in the criminal justice system. And with this slide, I want to highlight you know, the fact that blacks represent 13% of the US population, however, account for 27% of all arrests. And in 2019, the incarceration rate of black males was almost six times that of white non-Hispanic males. And similarly, the incarceration rate of black females was nearly two times the rate of, non, of, of white non-Hispanic females. Uh, there was also a 2021 study that found that Hispanics were incarcerated at a rate of about 1.3 times higher than the rate of white non-Hispanics. And additionally, there was a survey from 2016 that found that 38% of state and federal prisoners reported having a disability whether cognitive, ambulatory, or vision, 
yet persons with disabilities account for 15% of the general population. So first, I also want to make sure that we all understand exactly what the Fair Housing Act prohibits. And that is, it prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, or financing of dwellings and in other housing-related activities on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, which includes sexual orientation and gender identity, disability, familial status, or national origin. So the Fair Housing Act does not explicitly pr protect a person with a criminal record from discrimination. However, a housing provider may violate the act by using criminal records to deny housing to people uh, that have protected characteristics that are listed in the Fair Housing Act, as we mentioned earlier. And in terms of who can be held liable for violations of the Fair Housing Act, that spans from private landlords to management companies, condominium associations, as well as third-party screening companies who provide screening reports to housing providers for applicants, uh, HUD-subsidized housing providers, and public entities that operate or administer or fund housing, or that enact ordinances that restrict access to housing. So there are three theories of liability under the Fair Housing Act. The first that I'll discuss is discriminatory intent, which is also known as disparate treatment. The second is discriminatory effects, which is, known as, which is also known as disparate impact. And then I'll pass it to my colleague, Anna, to discuss the refusal to make reasonable accommodations. So a housing provider may violate the act if they intentionally discriminate in their use of criminal history information, meaning that they treat an applicant or a renter differently because of a protected characteristic. Uh, so in the way that we understand this, uh, the way that we analyze this is that basically when a housing provider is using criminal records or other criminal history information, that use uh, can be seen as pretext for unequal treatment because of a protected characteristic. And in those cases, that is no different from discriminatory application of any other rental or purchase criteria. So some examples that we've seen in some of our cases or that we've heard about is uh, where a housing provider rejects a Hispanic applicant based on a criminal record, but then admits a non-Hispanic white applicant with a comparable criminal, criminal record, or a property manager discourages a black applicant with a criminal record from applying um, but encourages a white individual with a comparable record to apply for housing, or after learning that an individual was previously, uh, that an applicant was previously homeless and hospitalized for treatment of a mental health condition, um, the management company departs from its standard procedures and runs a criminal background check and then ultimately denies that person housing. And some other examples include a housing provider evicts a uh, black tenant who was convicted of a crime, but does not evict a white tenant who was convicted of a similar crime. Or we've seen examples where a locality applies a crime-free ordinance requiring the eviction of criminally involved residents in a neighborhood with a significant black or Hispanic population, but does not apply the ordinance in neighborhoods that are predominantly populated by white households. So for claims that are um, brought that 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 allege that a housing provider used a criminal record policy or other criminal record information to discriminate intentionally, uh, those claims should be investigated in a manner that is similar to other allegations of intentional discrimination. And we definitely want to highlight the 2018 Office of General Counsel Elements of Proof memo um, that describes exactly what evidence is used to prove claims of intentional discrimination. Uh, one of the first things that that memo specifically describes is that evidence may be direct or circumstantial, which we'll discuss in the next few slides. So direct evidence most typically takes the form of a facial discriminatory statement or policy. So for instance, if a housing provider makes an oral or written statement that indicates a preference for an applicant or tenant that is not of complainant's protected class, those statements would be considered direct evidence of discrimination. Um, similarly, a policy is facially discriminatory if it explicitly treats members of a protected class less favorably than those who do not belong to the protected class. And a, a great example of that is one of the examples that we highlighted earlier where, for instance, the landlord moved to evict a Black tenant who had a criminal record but did not do so for a white tenant who had a comparable record. 
And unless there is direct evidence of discrimination of discriminatory intent, uh, such as the written or oral statements or a policy that that explicitly treats people of a protected class different or less favorably, then evidence is usually gathered and analyzed using the McDonnell Douglas shifting burdens framework. Uh, first, the evidence must establish that a prima facie case for disparate treatment. Uh, first, the evidence must establish a prima facie case for disparate treatment. And uh, some sample prima facie elements are listed on the 2018 OGC, OGC memo, so please consult that. Um, but just know that the, uh, the courts have determined that those tests are not to be so rigid, and so elements will adjust to fit any particular case or circumstance that, I, that might be at issue that, that you're investigating. The burden then shifts to a housing provider to offer evidence of a legitimate non-discriminatory reason, which has to be clear, it has to be reasonably specific, and it has to be supported by admissible evidence. But the plaintiff and complainant may still prevail if the criminal record was not the true reason for the adverse housing decision and was instead mere pretext for unequal treatment of a protected characteristic. So the uh, second theory of liability under the Fair Housing Act that I want to highlight is discriminatory effects. So a housing provider that has a facially neutral policy or practice um, that has a discriminatory effect on a protected characteristic would violate the act if that policy is unjustified, if it is, un excuse me, if it is unjustified. So basically where a policy or practice uh, that restricts access to housing on the basis of criminal history has a disparate impact on members of a protected class, that policy or practice is unlawful if it is A, not necessary to serve a substantial legitimate non-discriminatory interest, or B, if it could be served by another practice that has a less discriminatory effect. So discriminatory effects liability is assessed under a three-step burden shifting standard. First, the plaintiff or HUD must prove that the criminal history policy has a discriminatory effect. Uh, and we'll go through each one of these in just a moment. I just want to highlight the or over, overview the steps first. But first, the plaintiff or HUD has to prove that there is a discriminatory effect. Second, the housing provider must prove that the challenge policy is justified, meaning that it is necessary to achieve a substantial legitimate and non-discriminatory interest. And third, if the housing provider successfully proves that its criminal history policy is justified, the plaintiff or HUD must prove that such interest could be served by another practice that has a less discriminatory effect. So step one, does the policy have a discriminatory effect? So this particular step is a very fact-specific and case-specific inquiry. Um, it's really important to consult local statistical evidence where it's available. Um, that evidence can be used to evaluate whether a challenge policy has a disparate impact on a protected class. My colleague Maggie will go, a, go into a little, a little bit more depth about what types of evidence should be used based on what uh, sort of claim or allegation or what policy is at issue. Um, but if local statistics are not available, then there is no reason to believe that they would, and, and there is no reason to believe that they would differ from national statistics, then national statistics can, be, can also be used. Um, additional evidence such as applicant data, tenant files, census demographic data, and localized criminal, criminal justice data may also be relevant. It's also important to note that housing providers may offer evidence to refute the claim that its policy or practice has a discriminatory effect. So if you're bringing these cases, if you're investigating these cases, it's important to consider that, um, to potentially rebut that if that's the case. Um, but that, that is a possibility for housing providers to be able to provide that information. Step two, is the policy justified? So the housing provider must prove that the challenge policy or practice is necessary to achieve a substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory interest of the provider. Uh, so it's important to also note that the housing provider has to submit evidence that proves that first there isn't an interest, and then second, that the, uh, that the policy itself is necessary to further whatever that interest is. And what we see a lot of times in our cases um, is where some, some landlords and property managers assert that protecting other residents in their property is the reason. However, a housing provider still has to show that the challenge policy actually achieves safety among residents if that is the interest that they're asserting. Uh, 
Step two, is the policy justified? Continue. Uh, so one, so two examples that we highlight in the 2016 uh, criminal guidance memo that Richard mentioned earlier is exclusion because of prior arrest and exclusions because of prior convictions. Um, for exclusions because of prior arrests, these exclusions cannot satisfy a housing provider's burden to show that the policy or practice is necessary to achieve a substantial legitimate non-discriminatory interest. And that's because arrest records do not show proof of past unlawful conduct. They're just allegations or suspicions that someone has possibly engaged in a crime so, or, it, or in criminal conduct. So without any indication of a prosecution or conviction or acquittal, um, arrests are likely not sufficient for the housing provider to prove that. Exclusions because of prior conviction will serve as sufficient evidence to prove that someone engaged in certain criminal conduct, but the housing provider still has to prove that the policy to exclude based on those convictions is necessary to achieve a substantial non-discriminatory, uh, substantial legitimate non-discriminatory non interest. Uh, blanket prohibitions um, just will not suffice. You know, there can't be a blanket ban all convictions whatsoever. But even then, even more tailored policies that exclude certain types of convictions still have to be justified. And so the housing provider still has to provide sufficient evidence that there is a justification. Step three, is there a less discriminatory alternative? So this step is only applicable if the housing provider successfully proves that its policy is justified. So at that point, if that has been proven, then plaintiff or HUD has the burden to prove that such interest could be served by another practice that has a less discriminatory effect. Um, less discriminatory alternatives would depend on the case, but one thing Mr. Johnson mentioned in terms of what he would like for housing providers to do is to do more individualized assessments, and this is something that we brought up in the 2016 criminal guidance, uh, criminal records guidance, uh, looking at the relevant mitigating information, because that is likely to have a less discriminatory effect. Uh, relevant information can include the facts or circumstances that surround the criminal conduct, the age of the individual at the time of the conduct, any evidence that the individual has maintained a good tenant history before and or after the conviction of conduct or, or conduct, or any evidence of rehabilitation efforts. And just to just to note, this list is not exhaustive of all possibly relevant individualized evidence. Make sure that you understand exactly what evidence the the um, the complainant may may want to to put forward. And the last thing that I will touch on is the statutory exemption for exclusion because of illegal manufacture or distribution of a controlled substance. Uh, Section 807B4 of the Fair Housing Act does not prohibit conduct against a person because such person has been convicted of the illegal manufacture or distribution of a controlled substance <clears throat> as defined in Section 102 of the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, there is a limita limitation on this exemption. First of all, Section 807B4 only applies to disparate impact claims based on the denial of housing due to the person's conviction for drug manufacturing or distribution. It does not provide a defense to disparate impact claims for policies that are based on arrests. Additionally, it, is, uh, it only applies to disparate impact claims based on convictions for drug, uh, illegal manufacturing or distribution of a controlled substance and not any other drug crimes, specifically something like possession. Um, and then lastly, the exemption does not apply to disparate treatment cases because by virtue of what those cases are, that conduct is because of the protected characteristic and not the drug, the drug use itself. So for instance, if a landlord had an exclusion had a policy that excluded uh, black tenants from uh, black tenants from because if they if they have a policy that excludes convictions for uh, illegal manufacturing distribution of a controlled substance that is applied to only black residents and not white residents they allow a white resident who has a conviction of illegal manufacturing or distribution of a controlled substance this exemption would not apply. And with that, I will turn it back over to Kashana to turn it over to our next presenter. Thank you so much, Stefan. And actually, before we move on to Anna, um, I am going to ask um, for a quick clarification and then also a reminder. Um, the non-lawyers who are on the call, 
have made it very clear in the Q&A box that they would like um, some of the terms explained. I don't know that we're going to have time to do that right now, um, but I do want to remind all of our speakers to please, um, when at least using the Latin terms, if you're saying things like, you know, prima facie or something like that, if you could please just remember to quickly explain what a term like that means. Um, Stefan, could I just ask you though now before we move on to just quickly give on the spot uh, a, a quick and short primer on disparate impact and what that term itself means, um, if you wouldn't mind doing so. Sure, so disparate impact, which is one of the theories of liability under the Fair Housing Act, means that there is a policy or practice that is being employed by the landlord that has a discriminatory effect on a protected class. So in, those, in, in a situation like that, the landlord may not be overtly saying, I don't want you know, Black residents or I don't want Hispanic residents, or they're not using a policy that explicitly um, excludes only Black residents, but allows white, not Hispanic residents. Disparate impact really refers to a facially neutral policy. If the landlord says that I don't want anyone with a certain conviction, and then there's evidence that individuals um, who have those convictions are disproportionately a minority or specifically a protected class under the Fair Housing Act, if the landlord does not have any justification for having that blanket exclusion, and if there isn't a less discriminatory way of, um, of, 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 of advancing any interest that the landlord might have, that's when you have a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Does that explain it a little bit better? That was a very professional explanation. Thank you so much. I, I knew you could do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we will move on to our next panelist. And I do want to remind all of today's attendees that all of the slides from today's event are already available on the NAFTA forum page of the HUD Exchange site. And we will again place that link in the chat for everyone to access the slides from today's conversation. They're already available. The event is being recorded and that recording will also be available on the NAFTA page in the coming days. With that, our next panelist, Anna Bruton, will explain reasonable accommodation requirements as they relate to background screening policies. Anna. Thank you, Kashana. And again, welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Bruton, and I'll be discussing reasonable accommodations as they relate to criminal records uh, history and as well as uh, criminal records policies. So I'm going to begin the conversation with a quick poll question. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Stefan. Uh, I'm not sure if the question's coming up, so I will um, read it. Um, a property management company implements a policy requiring the denial of admission for any individual with two or more convictions. The management company states that such a policy is needed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of other residents. An individual with two recent public intoxication convictions applies for housing and requests a reasonable accommodation to the housing provider's policy. The individual tells the management company that they are addicted to alcohol. Can the housing provider permiss permissibly deny the applicant based on, its based on this policy? Yes or no answer. Okay, so it looks like from the results of our poll, 37% uh, of respondents answered yes, that the housing provider could, permiss could permissibly deny the applicant based on its policy, while 63% of respondents said no. Um, so just to clarify with this particular example, um, as most of you selected the majority, the correct answer would actually be no. And that is because addiction to alcohol, whether it's current or past, is generally considered a disability, 
Um, and so an individual with a current or past um, addiction tax haul may be entitled to a reasonable accommodation. So the housing provider in that circumstance should have performed a reasonable accommodation analysis and responded to that request before uh, making any final determination uh, for that particular applicant. So the reasonable, com the reasonable accommodation obligation um, exists under the Fair Housing Act, which applies to private and fairly funded housing providers. Um, it also exists under Section 504 of the Rehabilita Rehabilitation Act, which applies to recipients of federal financial assistance. Uh, next slide, please, Stefan. And the obligation also exists under the American with Disabilities Act, which applies to, which has two parts. So you have Title II of the ADA as well as Title III. So Title II of the American with Disabilities Act applies to housing built, operated, or sponsored by state, state or local governments. And Title III of the ADA applies to public accommodations associated with housing that are open to the general public in commercial facilities. So an example of housing under Title II or covered housing would be a public housing authority. An example of covered housing under Title II of, I'm sorry, under Title III of the ADA would be homeless shelters. Next slide, please. So the term reasonable accommodation is defined as a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule, policy, practice, or service that may be necessary for a person with a disability to have equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling, including public and common use spaces within the housing. And it's unlawful for a housing provider to refuse to make reasonable accommodations when they may be necessary to afford persons with disabilities an equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. And as a resource, um, those joining us today um, could also reference uh, the joint statement. It's a joint statement from HUD and the Department of Justice on reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act. Next slide, please. So when performing a reasonable accommodation analysis, there's a few kind of key things um, that need to be evaluated. So the first would be looking, evaluating, or assessing whether the individual does have a disability. And so this is going to be defined by statute and regulations, because under the Fair Housing Act, Section 504, and the ADA all include definitions of what constitutes a disability under those um, specific laws. Second, um, you would assess whether there's a disability-related need for the accommodation. So pretty much here, you're looking at what is the link between the disability and the, the accommodation, the reasonable accommodation that's being requested. Um, third, third, also assessing whether the accommodation is reasonable. And generally, um, absent a, stat a statutory exception, which are um, under the Fair Housing Act, um, Section 504 and ADA, they all have um, statutory exceptions to the reasonable accommodation obligation, which are either um, the two ex exceptions are undue financial and administrative burden or, or fundamental alteration um, to the actual housing uh, program. So absent one of those exceptions applying, um, and a reasonable accommodation is generally gonna be deemed reasonable and, and, and a housing provider would have to provide it um, under the law. Also, as a part of the analysis, it's important to note that an individual who is requesting an accommodation um, does not need to use any kind of formal process. Um, a housing provider can't require any formal process in order for an individual to request an accommodation. Um, an individual with a disability can request an accommodation verbally or in any other format. Um, there are no special or magic words that have to be used. They don't need to specifically say, like, I'm requesting a reasonable accommodation. That does not have to be a part of their um, request. Uh, housing providers must grant a reasonable accommodation request that's made on behalf of the individual, uh, that's made by the individual with, with a disability, or also um, on behalf of an individual with a disability. So you can have um, third parties or other individuals that can make a reasonable, a reasonable accommodation request on behalf of a person that does have a disability. So that could be a medical provider, a family member, um, anything of that kind of sort. Also to add, um, housing providers cannot ignore known or obvious disabilities. 
And there may be circumstances where a provider may be required to provide an accommodation when the provider has knowledge of the individual's disability and the need for a particular accommodation. Next slide, please. So with regard to reasonable accommodations in criminal records, um, under federal fair housing and disability laws, an individual with a disability has the right to request a reasonable accommodation to a housing provider's criminal records screening policy. So most commonly, um, you might see an individual with a disability request a reasonable accommodation to such a policy when they're either applying for housing or when they are um, applying to participate in a supportive service or another activity that's offered by a housing provider. Next slide, please. Also to note, an individual with a disability can request a reasonable accommodation to a housing provider's criminal record screening policy prior to the screening taking place, during the actual screening process, or after the screening has already been completed by the housing provider. The housing provider must consider the request and respond to the individual's accommodation request prior to making any final housing determination. If an individual requests a reasonable accommodation after a determination has already been made by a housing provider, the housing provider must reevaluate the individual's application in light of the accommodation request. And failure uh, to grant a reasonable accommodation constitutes a disability discrimination under federal fair housing and non-discrimination laws, specifically the Fair Housing Act, Section 504, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Next slide, please. So to kind of evaluate the interplay between criminal history, reasonable accommodations, and substance abuse, I've posed kind of, kind of a hypothetical here for us to discuss and review. And I'll, I'll read it out loud. An applicant applies for a one-bedroom apartment in May 2022. The results of her criminal background screening reflect two misdemeanor drug possession convictions in January 2021. When questioned about her background, the applicant explains that she started using illegal drugs to manage her, her hallucinations after she lost her medical insurance and could no longer obtain her prescribed psychiatric medication. The applicant further explains that she, that she is participating in a supervised rehabilitation program and is not currently using illegal drugs. The applicant requests a reasonable accommodation to the housing provider's criminal record screening policy. Based on the facts above, can the housing provider outright deny this request? Next slide, please. So to assess this situation, you first have to look at how drug use and addiction are treated under the law. So individuals who currently engage in the legal use of drugs are specifically excluded from the definition of disability under federal fair housing and non-discrimination laws and are not entitled to the protections um, under those laws. Um, contrary, Drug addiction is a disability that is recognized um, under federal for housing and non-description laws. And federal disability laws provide protections for an individual who is participating in a supervised drug rehabilitation, rehabilitation program and is no longer engaging in the use of illegal drugs. It also provides protection to an individual who has, success, who has successfully completed a supervised drug rehab, rehabilitation program or has otherwise been successfully rehabilitated and is not currently engaged in the legal use of drugs. Or an individual who is erone, erroneously regarded as engaging in illegal drug use, but is actually not engaged in such use. So based on the scenario that was given in the previous slide, um, this individual may be entitled to a reasonable accommodation, and thus the housing provider could not outright deny her reasonable accommodation request. So now to address kind of the interplay between criminal history, uh, reasonable accommodations, and the concept of direct threat, um, I have an another hypothetical here to, um, for discussion. So again, I'll read it out loud. A tenant has resided in his apartment building for eight years without incident. A new management company recently, recently took over and required that all tenants reapply. The results of the tenant's criminal background screening showed a 15-year-old felony assault conviction. When asked about his background, the tenant, exp the tenant explained that he got into an altercation with another, another individual during a mental health exacerbation caused by a lapse in treatment. The tenant produced records showing a history of compliance with his medication treatment regimen and accolades for community service, 
However, the management company relies on this conviction to determine that the tenant presents a direct threat and issues the tenant a, an eviction notice. The management company denies the tenant's reasonable accommodation request to their criminal records policy. Is the housing provider likely to succeed using a direct threat argument? Next slide, please. So in order to kind of assess the situation and make determinations under the direct uh, threat standard, you kind of have to look at several factors. So let's kind of look at what the law says first. So the Fair Housing Act does not require that a dwelling be made available to an individual whose tenancy would constitute a direct threat to the health or safety of other individuals or whose tenancy would result in substantial physical damage to the property of, of others. However, a housing provider must have reliable objective evidence that an individual with a disability poses a direct threat before excluding them from housing on that basis. And a provider cannot base this determination on fear, speculation, or stereotype about a particular disability or persons with disabilities in general. Next slide, please. I think we go back one, if we skipped one, sorry. There we go. So a determination that an individual poses a direct threat must rely on individual must rely on an individualized assessment that is based on reliable objective evidence. The assessment must consider the nature, duration, and severity of the risk of injury, the probability that injury will actually occur, and whether there are any reasonable accommodations that will eliminate the direct threat. Also, as part of the individualized assessment, a housing provider must also take, take into account whether the individual has received intervening treatment or medication that has eliminated the direct threat. So going back to the scenario that was presented earlier in the hypothetical, it's likely that the housing provider would not um, be successful in a direct threat argument in this particular case. Um, and just pointing out a couple of factors why. One, the conviction as noted in the hypothetical was um, dated. It was 15 years old. Um, there was no evidence um, that, that, that there had been any recent or further um, danger posed by the tenant, um, no conflicts with other tenants or anything of that sort. Um, the particular tenant had an eight year history of living at the property without any incident. Um, the tenant also produced information showing that he was compliant with his medication, with his treatment, and also um, provided information um, regarding accolades about all his community work. So all these things would go in favor of, um, of the tenant and would seek to um, show that the tenant would not be, uh, would not pose a direct threat um, to the health and safety of other residents at the property. Next slide, please. So just regarding uh, finally some best practices that housing providers um, could follow regarding uh, reasonable accommodations. Um, have fair written reasonable accommodation procedures that are available in accessible formats. Um, making sure that house providers document reasonable accommodation requests, uh, interactions with applicants and residents, and the actions taken to resolve the request. Um, housing providers should uh, engage in the interactive process with applicants and residents uh, when necessary. Um, they should also be making individualized determinations on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, they should be reasonable in their assessments and in their determinations. And also um, something just to note for um, those who do receive HUD funding and those who are recipients of federal financial assistance, that recipients of HUD assistance and federal financial assistance have an obligation to monitor the compliance of, of their subrecipients. So what this means is that recipients are responsible for making sure that their subrecipients, anyone who they um, uh, give uh, HUD, HUD assistance to, to complete a program or perform a service. Uh, recipients are responsible for making sure that their subrecipients are complying with the law, including the Fair Housing Act, Section 504, and the ADA. And so with regard to individuals with, with disabilities, making sure that they're not engaged in any activity that is discriminatory against individuals with disabilities and making sure that reasonable accommodations are being provided. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kashana. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Anna. Um, and before we move on, I have another quick follow-up for you as well, another point of clarification. And if you could just give us a quick uh, explanation so that we can stay on time, I would appreciate it. But we have several attendees who are asking for clarity around um, substance and alcohol use and disability when someone uh, will be considered a person with disabilities. And we have several attendees who have mentioned that um, they had the understanding that people who were in recovery from substance or alcohol abuse might be considered as a person with a disability under the Fair Housing Act, but that people who were actively um, using or abusing these substances would not be considered a person with a disability. And so can you just give a bit of clarity there, please, if you don't mind? So sure. So starting with the latter. Um, so yes, that is true. So an individual who is actively using illegal drugs or substances under the Fair Housing Act, the ADA and Section 504, they would not be considered a person with a disability and those protections would not apply to them versus a person who is in recovery um, in a rehabilitation program and that is also not currently using the illegal drugs or substances um, could be, could be uh, considered a person with a disability and those protections under the Fair Housing Act, Section 504 and the ADA would apply to them. Now regarding the first, I think part of the question, I think I would need uh, just a little bit more on that because I'm not quite too sure. Um, well, it's just, again, people's question is whether someone has to be in recovery to be considered a person with a disability, or can they be actively um, using or abusing um, alcohol and other substances and still be a person with a disability? Is the requirement in order to be a person with a disability, is the requirement that the person be in recovery, I think is just the question. Okay. so. Because you mentioned alcohol, let me just clarify that because that's something that can get a little conflated because the standards are different. Yes, so when it comes you. to alcohol, it does not matter if the person is currently abusing alcohol or if they were abusing in the past. Under the Fair Housing Act, Section 504 and the ADA, they can be considered a person with a disability and still receive protections under that law. So they do not have to be in recovery if they are abusing alcohol. Now, when it comes to illegal drugs, that's where the standard is different. So if you're currently using an illegal drug, um, again, you're not covered by the protections under the Fair Housing Act, Section 504 and the ADA. But if you are in recovery, like say if you're in a rehabilitation program um, and you're not using the illegal drug, then yes, um, you could be considered an individual with disability and, and re receive the protections under those uh, three laws that I stated earlier. Thank you so much, Anna. That is very helpful. Our next panelist, Maggie Donahue, will examine best practices for housing providers in their use of criminal records to screen tenants and for investigators who are looking to see if there is statistical evidence showing that a criminal records policy has a disparate impact. Maggie. Thanks, Kashana. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maggie Donahue. Like Kashana said, I am a trial attorney in the Office of General Counsel at HUD in our Fair Housing Enforcement Division. And so I'm uh, very excited to talk about these two topics. I will say I don't have enough time to say everything that HUD has recently said about these two topics. You can find a lot more detail, a lot more best practices than I'm going to be able to cover in the June 10th memo that Demetria McCain referenced earlier, and it's linked at the bottom of this slide. So I'd encourage everybody to check out that memo for a more fulsome discussion of these topics. Um, and so I wanted to start with talking about statistics, looking at statistics to try to figure out whether a policy or a practice is causing a disparate impact. And the overall point that I want everyone to take home from this is that while there's a lot of resources out there, um, a lot of statistics out there that you can look at and you should look at, um, this stuff can get very complicated. And so you really wanna get in touch with an economist or a statistician early on. And for those investigators at HUD who are listening, if you have one of these cases, get in touch with the Office of Systemic Investigations and they um, may be able to help you connect with an expert early on. 
Um, so um, before you even get into the statistics, before you, um, you even talk with an expert, um, one thing that's very important to do, tip number one, is identify the policy or practice and get the details. What is the policy or practice? You need to know that before you can tell whether that policy or practice is causing a disparate impact. And this may seem pretty obvious, right? Um, but actually figuring out what the policy or practice is can be complicated. A lot of times you'll have a landlord who will have a written policy that will be different from what they tell tenants or applicants the policy is. And that might be different from what the actual policy in practice is. So you want to look at all the iterations of the policy, um, identify those, figure out what they are, and analyze all of them. Um, there's also going to be situations where the landlord will tell you, we don't have a policy, we farm this out to a different, um, to a, a third party, they're the ones that do all the screening, we don't have a policy, it's their fault if there's any discrimination happening, and um, they, they sort of point the finger and leave you with no information. Well, um, when it, it's true that um, that uh, a lot of the times the, the the landlord will be farming this out, but it, and and maybe the third party screen company is someone that you want to consider adding as a respondent in the matter. But at the same time, it's still the landlord's policy. And um, to get to the point of tip number one, figuring out what the policy is, a third party screening company is a great source of information for you to explore to try to hone down on what the actual policy or practice is. So you can conduct interviews, request information from the third party screening company to help you figure out this information. You can Google, find out how is the third party screening company marketing its product to its clients? What are they saying are the criteria that can be set? What are they saying about who actually is um, setting that criteria. So you get a lot of finger pointing a lot of the times and, and your job as an investigator is to, is to figure out um, what the policy is, step one. Um, now, uh, step two is very much related to step one. So um, identify statistics that are specifically tailored to the policy or practice. And um, I have a quote from the Supreme Court um, from uh, the Landmark Decision and Inclusive Communities Project that a disparate impact claim relying on a, st a statistical disparity must fail if the plaintiff cannot point to a defendant's policy or policies causing that disparity. So pointing to the policy or policy causing the disparity, pointing to it is one, step one, step two, step two is tailoring your statistics so you can actually show that causation. And if you look at HUD's regulations on disparate impact, they also emphasize um, the importance of showing the causation, the causal relationship between the two. So when we're talking about how you, um, what do you mean by tailoring your statistics specifically to the policy or practice? Well, um, let's take an example. So. Um, if you have, for example, a policy or practice where the landlord says no one who's on probation or parole can um, live in this property, well, the best thing for you to find are statistics that are um, specifically about people on probation and parole for the relevant populations, not, for example, people who have been arrested. Um, so as, as close as you can get to the actual policy, the better. Okay, so um, I just mentioned relevant population. So who is the relevant population? Now, the most relevant population is going to be the actual, for when you're talking about screening policies, the actual applicants um, and the actual people who are rejected. So if you are lucky enough to be able to figure out the demographics of the people who are applying and the demographics of the people who are rejected because of a policy, that's 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 great and that's who you want to use. So let's say you are able to get this data and it's going to be most likely the case if you had a, a, sub, sub, a HUD subsidized landlord who's required to keep this data. Um, you get this data and you see, for example, that out of everybody who's applying to this property, 20% of the people are Hispanic. 
but then um, let's say the policy is a policy that rejects people with any felony conviction. And then you look into who's rejected because of a felony conviction and you see that 70% of the people who are rejected are Hispanic. That is evidence showing that there's a disparate impact on Hispanics um, based on this policy. Now, I wanna go back to the point that I made to begin with about consulting with an economist or a statistician. Um, even when you have actual data, which is the most straightforward data you're going to get, you want to be um, consulting with someone, um, for example, to let you know, do you have enough numbers? Is your, is your sample size big enough in order to make uh, a conclusion about disparate impact and causation here? Um, now, a lot of the times, you are not going to have that information about the demographics of who's applying and who's um, who's uh, being rejected because of a policy. Um, most landlords are not going to have information about the race, ethnicity, disability status of applicants, and then who's who's rejected. And so you're going to need to find other data to see if a policy predictably results in a disparate impact on a protected class. And um, let's see. so um, what, is, what is the relevant population there if you don't have actual data and you're looking at this predictably results question? Um, well, you're going to be wanting to figure out who the likely applicant pool is. So what's the relevant market area? Are people coming just from um, this, uh, mostly from the same county? Are people coming from all across the United States? Are they coming from a few specific zip codes? Uh, what's, what's going on there in terms of what the relevant market area is? And then also, are there other, what are the other screening criteria at the, at the property? Um, are there certain income restrictions? Are there things that make the applicant pool here different from what you might find in the general population? Um, you want to be looking at that information. And again, here is when it's especially important to be consulting with an expert. Now, um, when you are looking on your own, for statistics that are out there, criminal justice statistics and statistics that are just um, in the, um, about general demographics of specific areas. There's a lot of resources and these are in the June 10th memo in a lot more detail, but um, I just wanna, and, and they're here on this slide, and I, I wanna highlight that it's possible that you still won't be able to find the best data and you might have to actually pick up the phone or send an email, contact state or local government or criminal justice agencies to obtain relevant criminal justice data. Um, and I wanted to um, show you all just some examples of what you can find on some of the um, web resources that I referenced in the slide earlier. So here I have a screenshot from the Vera Institute um, for people like me who like to see charts and graphs. Um, they have a lot of um, uh, helpful charts and graphs. I wanted to sort of check out what are the racial disparities that, that this website has related to where I grew up in Lake County, Illinois. So I typed that in and this chart here shows um, and um, what, what disparities exist in the uh, population who's in jail. And so as you can see here, there's a huge disparity. Only 7% of the people in Lake County, Illinois are Black, but Black people constitute 50% of those people who are in jail. Um, so you can, you can also see um, Latinx people constitute 22% of the people in Lake County, but only 17% of the population. So there you can see a, a difference between what you see locally and what you might see nationally. Now, this is only jail. It doesn't include prison. So there's a lot more digging that you might have to do, but it, it's just helpful to see, I think, what's out there. Now, Stefan, during his presentation, mentioned the statistics that um, we had have cited in a couple of um, memorandums recently that we've released um, related to um, the disproportionate impact that the criminal justice system has on people with disabilities. And it, it, you can find that report that we cite um, on the Bureau of Justice Statistics website. And what I wanted to show you here is a screenshot just to see, you can, you can pull up reports. You can also pull up the raw data. You can see in the download section here, the data, data table download that you can do. It will pull up like a whole Excel spreadsheet 
Um, and there's just a ton of information on the, the BJS website. Um, and here, the last highlight here is the uh, statistic that I think that Stefan mentioned earlier. Um, and then here's from the census. Um, census.gov has so much information. It also has mapping tools um, for if you're like me and you like to look at visuals to help you figure out what's going on. And so I just highlighted here, like you can you can look at Florida and look at um, demographic characteristics for Florida. You can zoom in and get um, county specific information and there's just a lot of information there um, if you're if you're looking for the, the general demographics so um, i want to move on to best practices for landlords who want to reduce their risk of liability under the fair housing act um, and and this specifically relates to um, especially to disparate impact claims so um now, the first tip, and I saw somebody in the chat sort of say, why hasn't HUD been advocating for this kind of rule? Um, well, we do say, uh, suggest this as our first best practice in order to avoid liability in the Fair Housing Act um, related to criminal record screen policies is a consider not using criminal history to screen tenants for housing at all. Um, we recently um, released uh, uh, or posted on, on uh, HUD.gov uh, an article by Calvin Johnson here from um, our PDNR division and um, who uh, outlined um, a, a number of pieces of evidence showing that criminal history is not actually a good predictor of housing success. Now, this is not going to be possible to have a complete um, um, uh, um, to completely um, not look at criminal history for certain HUD subsidized landlords and public housing authorities. Um, but what I think a lot of a common misconception is that um, is, is that there needs to be more checking and more restrictions that actually exist under the statutes. And so we recommend for HUD assisted landlords to do the minimum that is required under the statutes in order and, and, and the HUD regulations in order to comply with those, um, those obligations, but no more. And that will help you avoid liability um, for doing too, many, too, too much criminal background checking that will lead to dis disproportionate impacts on those impacted by the criminal justice system. Um, so one common misconception is that landlords are required to conduct general criminal background, general broad criminal background checks for their programs. This is false. There is only one required criminal background check um, that, for example, PHAs and site-based Section 8 landlords um, are required to do, and that's for the sex, the lifetime sex offender registry bar. Um, and those landlords can, can conduct that check by going to the DOJ's website um, that compiles that information. Um, it's free. They don't have to use third-party screening companies. Which, um, which pose their own issues. Um, they don't have to do broader checks than, our, um, than just the, the sex offender registry bar. And um, another thing that I will say about this issue, again, because it seems to be a, a, a something that people are, have been interested in in the chat, is that um, there are um, also limited requirements to establish standards to prohibit admission for other very specific and limited criminal activity. So for example, those who are convicted of manufacturing methamphetamine on the premises of uh, federally assisted housing. Um, but conducting a criminal background check is not a required means to screen for those standards. You can have a, um, you can have a um, application question to that effect. Um, now, the other common misconception is that um, discretion is unlimited for those um, for HUD subsidized landlords, and that is also not true. Um, there's limitations based on program regulations and statutes, state and local laws, um, including in Chicago, where the Chicago Housing Authority is, which has a local law that um, requires an individual assessment. So I was very interested to hear Mr. Johnson's story. Um, and fair housing laws, of course, limit that discretion. Um, there's a number of other um, uh, best practices we suggest in the June 10th memo, limiting your evictions based on criminal activity, 
um, conducting an individualized assessment, only evicting for criminal activity as a last resort, never evicting a person because they're a victim of criminal activity. Um, uh, another practice that we have been hearing is becoming more and more common is the landlord is banning a tenant's invited guests from visiting that tenant based on the guest's criminal involvement. Now, um, this we have seen also impacts uh, families from being able to have family members visit them in their homes. And what we know is that this is a, a practice is actually illegal in most jurisdictions across the United States based on the common law covenant of quiet enjoyment that tenants have. Um, I'm going to go, I'm run, running out of time, so I'm going to have to go quickly here. Now, we have uh, a number of, um, if you do choose to use criminal record screening policies, a number of steps you can take to help you avoid potential violations of the Fair Housing Act. Um, there's a lot of them. I'll refer you to the June 10th memo to take a look at them. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight is that we do talk about conducting an individualized assessment. Um, and um, I believe Stefan talked about this um, in his presentation, so I won't get into a lot of this, but I will say that um, that should be limited to, uh, to times in which you have evidence that the um, criminal activity is going to impact the health and safety of the community. Um, and only then should you be um, taking that next step in, and then conducting the individualized assessment. And one of the reasons is because of a report that actually came out of Kashana's um, agency from 2015, where they found that when housing providers are using discretionary criminal record screening policies, doing a case-by-case -case analysis, they actually ended up favoring white applicants over similarly situated black applicants 55% of the time. So while we do talk about doing an individualized assessment to avoid fair housing liability um, in terms of disparate impact, you have to be very careful that you're doing that assessment in a fair way, not letting biases creep in, and limiting it to when, when you really need to do it, when you really have a crime that you've determined is and that's recent enough um, and that there's a pattern where you really have evidence that it's going to be impacting things. So I think I'm out of time. I'll turn it back to Kashana. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this topic. Thank you so much, Maggie. And we can definitely get um, more into sort of best practices during the Q&A session. Uh, and there actually have been questions already about the very point you raised, which is sort of how do we control for um, racial disparities that might happen if landlords are only using individualized assessments, right, when they are uh, thinking about screening. And so we can discuss that more once we hear from our um, final panelist. Uh, as we move on to Natalie Maxwell, one final reminder that the slides from today's event are already available on the NAFTA forum page of HUD Exchange. We are now going to move on to hear from Natalie Maxwell, who will discuss the importance of evidence and provide a practical perspective on how to investigate these types of cases. Natalie. Thank you, Kashana. Uh, so for folks who are not familiar with the National Housing Law Project, uh, our mission is to advance housing justice for poor people and communities. We do this by strengthening and enforcing the rights of tenants, increasing ho housing opportunities for underserved communities, and preserving exp and expanding the nation's supply of safe and affordable homes. Um, and as part of our work, we provide technical assistance uh, to housing attorneys, um, tenant organizers, and um, housing justice advocates. And so some of the examples that I'm going to share today um, are taken from um, those examples from folks that we work with. Uh, so the um, attorneys from HUD have talked about uh, the different types of standards of proof for fair housing claims. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just take a deeper dive into the evidence um, that may be used if you are trying to investigate um, these types of claims as well as provide some real world examples. So as Stefan uh, mentioned, the disparate treatment um, or discriminatory intent cases under the Fair Housing Act 
um, involve um, intent to discriminate. So this intent can be um, proven by direct evidence, um, by the use of testing, or the burden shifting method that Stefan talked about. So with regard to um, direct evidence, you know, in, 20, in, in 2022, um, there we have lots of opportunities where people have provided um, video or audio recordings of things that have happened to them. Um, and those recordings include statements um, where we're talking about um, the, um, the creation of some of these um, crime-free housing programs. Um, oftentimes there have been meetings that have taken place at city councils or city commissions that have been recorded um, and that are, you know, that have been provided um, online through Zoom and remain available. Um, so you may be able to, to in investigating these claims, um, get access to that information. Um, and even if that information is not posted online, it might be available through public record requests. Um, so, uh, you know, another major way that, um, that these cases are proven is through uh, documentation, especially uh, publicly available documents that can be obtained during pre-suit investigations or as part of a um, testing. So that could be uh, photographs. It could um, include documents that reflect the policy. Um, as Maggie mentioned, however, sometimes the documents that are reflected in the policy are not necessarily what the actual uh, criminal record screening policy is, um, but, but it's a good place to start. Um, any documents that reflect the adoption or passage of a criminal um, screening uh, program or policy and any amendments to it. Um, the, there may be internal or external communications um, by relevant parties, um, by the housing providers, so including uh, deni uh, denials of applications. Um, there could be correspondence um, we've seen in, in the um, creation of crime-free housing programs and recruiting landlords to participate, communication from city officials um, or from the police department as to why they should be participating in those programs, and obviously uh, also websites. And so this is just an example of a property record that was um, publicly available. It's recorded in the property records. Um, and what it is, is it's, it's um, part of the covenants of a homeowners association um, that in order for owners within the association um, to rent out their property, there are a list, a list of requirements that they have to include in any leases um, that they have, as well as uh, cert certain screening that they are required to do. Um, and so in this example, um, the, the, and this is just a screenshot because the policy is much longer than this. Um, th this policy requires that any applicant convicted of a felony within the 10 years immediately prior to the application date shall be disapproved and that similarly any applicant convicted of a criminal charge within the 10 years immediately prior to the application date, um, which charge would constitute a felony in the state of Florida shall be disapproved. Um, so this is an example of, of um, when um, both Richard Cho um, and Stefan Woods were talking about uh, blanket bans or um, overly inclusive bans. And so, you know, we are still seeing these documents, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to highlight it, even though, um, as was mentioned, uh, you know, HUD issued guidance um, several years ago um, saying that these types of blanket bans are not permitted. Um, and so it's also worth noting here, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing in the interest of time, but that there's nothing in this policy that references any protected class. Um, so this is where the direct evidence becomes important because these um, policies usually are not passed in a vacuum, um, especially in recent years. 
Um, you know, if, for example, there were witness statements that were reported by the complainant um, or someone who had applied to live in this particular property, um, those there may be um, intentional discrimination that can be inferred from the statements, um, including any statements based upon stereotypes against protected classes. Um, so, for example, um, it, that wasn't the case here, but if in addition to having this policy, the, you know, the minutes of the homeowners association board meeting, board meeting included statements like, you know, we're trying to address the influx of urban communities um, into our neighborhood, um, then we're starting to get um, closer to having uh, intent uh, to, to exclude people um, based on race from a particular community. So in, in you know, the use of urban communities in this example, um, we've heard that type of coded language. So even where um, the folks passing the policy may not explicitly reference race, they um, may reference what is commonly, you know, understood coded language. Um, this, the next example here, um, is an example um, from taken from a management company um, that provides uh, services to a number of private landlords, um, and they encourage the use of this crime-free lease addendum. Um, so here, I, you know, I kind of I'm going to highlight this first. Um, what's paragraph two on the slide that the resident or any member of the resident's household or a guest or other person under the resident's control shall not engage in any act intended to facilitate criminal activity, including drug-related criminal activity on, near, or within the site, um, within sight of the premises. So this again is some example of broad-based language where this particular policy, um, you know, for example, could have an impact um, on survivors of um, domestic violence or intimate partner violence, um, whereby, you know, there is some criminal activity that occurs in the home, um, and we continue to see instances um, where the entire household is being evicted, um, even though there are clearly less discriminatory ways to address that, that situation. And for, um, as was mentioned earlier, with the federal um, housing programs, such activity would be prohibited by the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and this, this last example that I will share with you here um, is part of a crime-free housing program, and I think several of us have mentioned these, so I just want to make sure that folks know what I'm talking about when I say that. Um, so crime-free housing programs have really proliferated across the country um, in, many in many jurisdictions, both urban and rural, um, and they typically require property owners to execute a crime-free lease addendum um, with tenants. They um, require mandatory criminal background checks of tenant applicants, which as we just heard from Maggie is really not a best practice. Um, they also involve uh, some sort of mandatory landlord training um, and the participation in these programs can be either mandatory or voluntary. In addition, we see the crime-free housing programs um, often used in conjunction with the adoption of nuisance property ordinances. Um, and those ordinances have a broad definition about what nuisance conduct is um, and basically require the landlord to take certain steps to abate the nuisance. Um, otherwise, the landlord may be subjected to potential fines, fees, um, condemnation, or for jurisdictions where there's a property license, the loss of property license. Um, so this, this is a lease that was obtained through a, a public writer's request that also um, included a list of all the properties that were participating in the program. Um, and so as part of the investigation, there was some mapping of the locations of where these properties were located um, to see, um, to overlay that with the demographics of the area. 
Um, so as um, other folks have mentioned, there uh, another way to show discriminatory intent is by um, showing the housing provider is treating protected classes differently. So there's a few examples here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just move on to disparate impact in the interest of time. Um, so it the disparate impact can be proven using the same types of evidence under a disparate treatment case. Um, but also, um, this is a place where we see the use of statistical evidence. Um, and so I wanted to just provide uh, and talk a little bit about an example of how testing can be used in these cases. Um, so there's a report um, that was created by the Equal Rights Center um, called Unlocking Discrimination. And um, what they did with that testing um, was, uh, so, well, let me back up. So the Equal Rights Center is a private fair housing organization. And so as part of their um, fair housing work, they, um, they engage in testing um, to uncover um, whether housing discrimination is occurring. And so for anyone who's not familiar with the idea of testing, um, it's basically like a, it's a secret shopper for housing discrimination. Um, and so what they did was look at whether white and African-American female testers who were um, posing as having similar criminal backgrounds were treated differently on the basis of race when they went to apply for housing in the DC area. Um, and so through that, they were also able to gather information about criminal record screening policies and procedures that local housing providers had um, in place. And so that testing revealed that in fact, um, there, there was discriminatory treatment based on race. Um, and then, with regard to um, the types of statistics that um, might be used, I've highlighted a few cases here. Um, and so I'm just gonna touch on one and then um, folks can, can read more um, if they're interested um, from the slide deck. But so the first case, the Jackson versus Tryon Park Apartments um, is a New York case where the um, complaint uh, relied on um, e some EEOC guidance that cited to national statistics about arrests and general, popu uh, general population rates of African Americans. Um, the DOJ estimates about the rate of, ex of um, um, expected um, people to be impacted by the policy based on race and, ethnic and ethnicity, and then also relied on New York State data on incarceration rates and prison release. And so this is just in, important for the point um, because this data was sufficient to survive a motion to dismiss, which um, when these cases get filed in court often is the first step in testing um, whether or not the case will be allowed to go forward. Um, so some other evidence um, that of disparate impact that it's important to try to obtain um, to the tenant selection plan, any applicant data, census data, eviction data, tenant files. Um, and with regard to um, the mitigating factors, so on the slide I have included um, information about mitigating factors related to criminal history, such as the nature of the crime, the circumstances surrounding the criminal conduct, the age at the time of the conduct, um, et cetera. But it just in addition, it's worth noting that other mitigating circumstances that we've talked about so far today um, are around whether that criminal history is related to, to the disability or um, for federally assisted housing, whether that criminal history is related to um, an incident um, of domestic violence, um, intimate partner violence or sexual assault um, or other gender-based violence that's covered by the Violence Against Women Act. Um, so. Kashana, I don't know if we have time to do this last poll. You know what, Natalie? I don't think we do. Um, we have a ton of questions to get to um, that I'm going to try to distill down. Um, but if there are a few um, closing words you want to say, please, please go ahead. Um, so what I'll just leave you with is, so um, is I've created here on these slides, just a list of questions to try to answer um, with the evidence in the different, um, the different 
um, parts of the housing housing process where the criminal screening comes up. So in the tenant screening and admissions policies, um, we also see this come up in the eviction context. And then finally, with crime-free housing programs and nuisance ordinances. Um, since folks will have the slides, I'll go ahead and leave it there and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, and thank you so much to all of our panelists for your time today and for your presentations. With that, we are going to move into the question and answer portion of today's forum. We don't have a lot of time, so we are going to jump right in. Uh, for the first question, I'd like to pick back up on something um, that we were discussing um, during Maggie's presentation about individualized assessments. Now, we've had several attendees write in that they were looking for suggested best practices and or um, policies, uh, information around how they can craft their policies. And so, so that we can leave having given um, housing providers some practical advice and best practices I'd like to specifically ask about individualized assessments. From everything that has been discussed today, it seems like indiv individualized assessments might be helpful in terms of not um, violating the Fair Housing Act. But as we heard from Maggie, and as we know from the experiences of uh, many lawyers and of course people directly impacted all across the country, the individualized assessments still leave a very large risk of housing providers using discretion in a discriminatory way, right? Um, so providing opportunities for white applicants that people of color are not getting. How can we manage this risk of ensuring that individualized uh, assessments and discretion don't lead to, as advocates in my community say, um, denial for people of color, right? How can we ensure that that doesn't happen? And if nobody would like to uh, jump in, I, I will do something that I've never done in my role as moderator. And I actually have thought quite a bit and worked quite a bit um, on this exact question. And so I will take just a few moments to share um, what it is that we provide to landlords um, when we get this very same question. So it feels important to make sure um, that landlords start from a place of crafting screening policies that are going to provide equal access to housing opportunity, right? So approaching the policy um, as a way to ensure that everyone has access to housing rather than approaching the policy as a way to keep uh, people with arrests or convictions in their backgrounds out of housing. Landlords should also consider creating policies that have reasonable and defined look back periods if they are going to consider um, convictions. And they should, of course, as we've heard today, not consider arrests. And they should have policies that don't contain broad bans against a certain kind of convictions like felony convictions. To the point about individual circumstances, if they're going to be considered, we always suggest that they should be paired, those individual circumstances should be paired with defined screening categories and criteria for admission. And so what that might mean is that if a landlord is going to say that they consider individual um, circumstances, they should clearly state in writing what those individual circumstances are. So people who are applying should get information from the landlord that says, um, we will look at if you have any convictions in your background, we are going to look at the length of time since the conviction maybe, um, or we will look at whether or not you have completed any sort of treatment. We will look at your ties to the community. So rather than just acting on vibes or feelings about an individual, which again, we know can allow some discrimination to creep in, housing providers should have set standards for the circumstances that they would consider. And of course, the biggie is always making sure to apply the policy consistently across racial groups. So that's what I would say um, about this topic in terms of using individualized assessments. Does anyone else have anything to add on that? Um, I, I just want to put a, put in a plug for the, the June 10th memo, and, and it, there's actually um, a couple points that that memo makes about how you can try to make sure 
that you're not doing more discrimination when you're engaging in the individualized process. And, and sort of what I alluded to before, um, what it says is that individualized reviews should be utilized only in clearly delineated circumstances when the individual would otherwise be excluded because of current reliable evidence that the specific crime at issue would threaten safety and or property. And I think that's, that's one of the most important things. Thank you, Maggie, that's very helpful. And yes, um, it is, I think, critically important that people concerned about whether their uh, policies violate uh, the Fair Housing Act should definitely take a look at that memo. Um, it does have some incredibly helpful information in it. Um, so we will move on. And Stefan, we actually had several questions for you um, around the test um, that you shared and specifically with regard to step two of the disparate impact test. Um, I think the attendees who have asked about this are hoping to get a sense of what type or amount of evidence must be provided to show that um, a challenged policy or practice is necessary. Um, we had a question about whether step two is going to require that a housing provider show um, that uh, if they didn't have this policy, safety would be worse than it is. So just how can people meet that burden uh, really seems to be the question. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, yeah, just a few. I think that it's going to be a very, it's it's difficult to give like an exact sort of like example of what it looks like because it really depends on each case. I think that the main takeaway from that point is that housing providers really cannot just say, oh, it's just to enhance the property or this is going to exclude like a, a very generic blanket statement. Like if there is some proof that there are certain issues that are present at the property specific to whatever crime um, that is at issue that a policy that the, that the landlord is employing in its policy, then they have to show like how those uh, like the nexus between like how do you achieve safety and if it's actually being achieved because you are employing this policy. Um, so it's it, it I think it's just really going to be dependent on 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 each case the investigator has to look at reliable evidence has to really question what the landlord is producing to see if 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 this is in fact what the issue is. Um, I, I hope that's a little helpful. Um, I don't know if Maggie or Anna, you have anything to add to that, but that's that's really the, the crux of the issue with that. Anything to add? Yeah, I, I don't think HUD has has made any official statements about what, you know, what would be enough um, to like, like with the specifics of like, you know, do you need to produce a peer reviewed article that says that, you know, there's evidence that, that people are going to reoffend if they have XYZ crime within this period of time? Like HUD hasn't said, given that specific um, guidance out there, you know, there's, there's court cases where um, the judges have said, have said that landlords are not liable for um, the criminal acts for not doing a background check because you know, the criminal justice system has already made a determination that the person is not a threat to the, the safety, right? They've been released in the community. And so there's been, there's been uh, cases where courts have said, you know, um, they couldn't have, the landlord couldn't know that this person would be a threat, um, but HUD hasn't actually uh, provided like specifics on what you could show to say that they would be. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, another question about um, HUD standards um, is from an attendee who is asking about whether HUD has established a threshold in order to deem a policy discriminatory. So if, for instance, a particular policy meant that 30% um, of African-American applicants and 20% or 25% of Latinx applicants were kept out, would those uh, percentages be high enough um, to create a disparate impact issue? Is there a standard for how high the percentage of excluded people needs to be 
So I, I can touch on this too. When we were writing the, the disparate impact rule um, back in 2013, this is something that we engaged with commenters on in rulemaking on whether or not um, it would be appropriate to give like a certain you know, threshold to establish a very specific threshold for what, what would bring you across the, the line to show discriminatory effect. Um, and what we ended up saying then is that, you know, it's because there's so many different types of cases um, that fall under disparate impact, it's really hard to establish that threshold. And when you look at the employment context, you know, the, the courts have recognized that, you know, everything's so case specific. And so you really have to approach it on a case by case basis to see what's, what's going to cross that threshold to, to, to show the, the causal disparate impact. Um, so. Thank no you so specific. much. Thank you, Maggie. That's very helpful. Um, I do want to also ask about uh, enforcement options. And I think, unfortunately, this may have to be our last question. So we had um, many attendees uh, write into the Q&A box that they're aware of um, HUD-assisted properties or um, public housing authority sites uh, where the best practices may not be complied with. And so the question is, um, if any of you know whether HUD is monitoring housing authorities um, compliance with uh, the memos that we've discussed or the best practices that we've discussed. And I think this is really, um, this question is rooted in uh, Mr. Johnson's experience that we heard about earlier where, you know, uh, a large housing authority um, has denied him access to housing based on um, his background. And so is anyone aware of any um, monitoring uh, that is taking place to ensure compliance? So I, I, I kind of want to actually call on uh, Kathleen Pennington, who's our Associate um, General Counsel for Fair Housing Enforcement, um, because I don't want to overstep and state uh, sort of like what what our process is, but at, at least I can say that Richard Cho, for instance, he did mention that we were in the process of implementing the secretary's memo, at least to, to identify areas where, um, where there is some sort of like inconsistency in terms of like the guidance that we're giving, that the agency is giving to HUD assisted um, housing providers. And so there is a possibility that that's like a natural outflow of that, but I also want to give Ms. Pennington an opportunity to speak on that if she has anything to add. Thanks, Stefan. I would just add that you should file complaints. You should let us know about these situations. I, I know that we were all looking with interest at the, the comments that people were making in the chat about situations where they've seen this. Um, and I, I would say definitely bring this information to us because we were very interested in handling these types of cases. And I don't know if Demetria wants to add anything to that. I think I can see that she's still on, and um, I, I feel certain that she agrees with us on that. But if you want to say anything, Demetria, please do. No, I just would uh, concur with those statements. Absolutely. This has been great, everybody. Uh, thank you, presenters. This has been excellent. Thank you so much, Demetria and Kathleen um, and Stefan for those responses. Now, Natalie, to you on the private side in terms of enforcement options, um, if people in their various communities are aware of uh, property owners that have um, screening procedures that may have a disparate impact on the basis of race, or if they are aware of broad bans against anyone who has an arrest or conviction in their background, what kinds of enforcement options are available for those folks? Uh, so in, in those um, cases, um, folks still have the ability to file complaints with HUD. HUD will investigate um, any allegations either against um, private housing providers um, or federally assisted housing providers. Um, I think it's also important for folks to um, know that 
there are several um, fair housing agencies across the country that are funded to investigate um, fair housing cases um, like Kashana's program, um, like the Equal Rights Center that I um, mentioned. And so if they have questions, they can reach out to their um, local fair housing center. Um, in addition, um, there are um, legal aid programs that are funded across the country um, that um, some of which have income restrictions. Um, so folks should be aware of that, um, but they can also help, um, especially because uh, um, as we mentioned in the presentation, some of these cases come in um, are identified um, when someone receives a notice for eviction. Um, and so those attorneys uh, may be able to assess those cases um, and in some cases will then, once they have dealt with that immediate um, eviction threat, refer them to the local fair housing partner um, to further work with them to file complaints. And last but not least, um, since I know we have attorneys on the call, um, if people are um, have an attorney who is representing them, um, they can file a lawsuit in state or federal court. Um, and finally, if they are in a, a jurisdiction that has local fair housing laws or ordinances, they can um, file complaints with their um, local fair housing administrative agency. Thank you so much, Natalie, uh, for that response. And thank you to all of our panelists today for a very insightful conversation. We are honored to have you with us and we thank you very much for your time. Thank you also to all of you for your participation in today's forum. We hope that you will join us for our next event. Please check out the NAFTA website for a description and important information on registration for upcoming forums. Please also connect with the National Fair Housing Training Academy on LinkedIn for insights and information about upcoming events, including future forums and courses. Thanks to everyone who made today's event possible, including, as always, our American Sign Language interpreters. Finally, please be on the lookout for a survey which will pop up when this training ends. The survey will allow you to provide feedback on today's event. Your feedback is critical to improving these forums. It shouldn't take very long to complete the anonymous survey and we do highly value your input. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you for the next NAFTA forum. Take care, everyone.